Well, good morning, those of you joining us in person or um, our friends who are joining us on the live stream. Um, just reminders about that you can send us comments or questions uh, through the live stream page. Uh, there's that little form right there, and it will send your comment or question, and then we'll pass them um, on to the speaker. Um, or you can send uh, by email to formationquestions at St. David's Church. Org. Um, and people in the room can do that too. If you are not a verbal um, asker, but you might still want to pass on some question or comment to us, you can do that as well, and we'll pass them on to Frank. Does that mean Sean? Possibly. Absolutely. Well, good. Well, thank you all for being here today. <laughs> We're living in it. I've got a, I've got a handout that's in the back, but I also have which I, I'm working on all the talks. So if you you know if you drift off sometime and you miss some incredibly pertinent point, you can go back and look at it. I've also had copies made of the Sermon on the Mount, so that they're easy for you to use. Um, and I will I'll walk into it with the Sermon on the Mount. Many of you know that I read through the Bible every year. I've got. In my Kindle, it starts in Matthew, it starts in Genesis, it starts in Matthew. You go through the Psalms and the Proverbs twice. And when you get to about June, you're through all the Gospels. And so you, I, I noticed seven or eight years ago, I started missing hearing Jesus' voice. Um, you know, helping me in my, in my um, own prayer life. And so I started making a commitment to read the Sermon on the Mount every month. Uh, because it reminds, some of you hear me joke that my kids call me a professional Christian because I get paid to be a Christian where you all don't get paid to be the Christian. But one of the things about the Sermon on the Mount for me, it reminds me what a Christian is supposed to be and do. And so over the last six or seven years, I've been reading it uh, consistently. And when I was away from my three-week mini sabbatical, uh, I did a bunch of reading and writing about the Sermon on the Mount. And so that's where this four-week course uh, has come out of just the, the strong sense in this year where we're focusing on faith matters, on knowing the faith and living the faith and sharing the faith. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a, a great way to think about what it is we believe, how we're supposed to live our lives, I mean, tangibly, and how then people, people can come to know God through us by the way we're living our lives. So, in, in this talk, we're going to, over the next four weeks or five weeks, because we have a theologian in residence coming the last Sunday in March, um, and then I'll pick it up the first, week, first Sunday in April, that it, it's important to remember that we need to, about how we know things and how we live our lives need to be integrated. And there's something about the Sermon on the Mount that gives us some of the tools to do that. Um, it's a... It's a, it's a challenge to live as followers of Jesus. Um, and a lot of us would like to think it's just trial and error, that we can just try things and do different things. And you can, but, and we all do. But, you know, when you've got a map or a plan laid out for you, why wouldn't you use it? And to me, that's a lot of what's in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's not a do these 20 things, um, but it is, a, it is a pathway for us to come to understand how we can give our lives over to God and how we can actually live that out in the world. Um, and we, we know from reading the scripture and coming to church and people around us who have helped point us on the way um, that we all need that. We need guides. And the Sermon on the Mount is one of those guides. Another guide for me when I was in seminary, there was this amazing woman named Verna Dozier who was a Christian educator. And one of the things... <laughs> And, and she's, she's really smart and a great educator of educators, and she had a snappy tongue. And one of the things that she said that I remembered, um, she, she once wrote that Christianity and Christians struggle when we move to worshiping Christ instead of following Christ. And we start, we start get caught up in, the, in kind of the symbolic and the, well, you don't have it at St. David's because there's no statues, but kind of the, the idols that, that religions sometimes bring into our lives, or religion itself, and that the goal is to follow. So how we follow is important. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, at least for me, Jesus lays out the pattern for what following him is all about. He describes a life that's open to God, 
to form us into Jesus' likeness, even while we're becoming our own selves. If you think about who Jesus is and his character, it looks like the Sermon on the Mount. That when you see the beauty of Jesus, the wonder, mercy, love, goodness of Jesus, this is how he is about living his life. And as we go through it, you're going to notice that even though this is three chapters, um, that you can pin all the parables and all the stories into places in the Sermon on the Mount, which is why I sort of joke that this is Jesus' stump speech, that, that he went around um, using this teaching or something similar to it, because they remember a lot of it. And Luke has it as a sermon on the plane, but they remember a lot of what he taught. And, and I know they were better listeners than we are because they, didn't have, they couldn't write things down or stick it in their phone. So they had to listen more carefully. But I don't think you can listen that carefully as Jesus is spinning out all these jewels, all these wonders about who God is and how we're to live our lives. So I think, that, I think this was the core of his teaching. When it says that he went from Capernaum to Nazareth and all the towns in the Galilee, he had a teaching. Any of you ever been around an evangelist, like a Christian evangelist, yeah? Sometime when I first got here, I got invited to three prayer breakfasts from different groups over the course of the year, and they had the same guy, a man named John Guest, who is a part of the wider Anglican, or continuing Anglican communion now. But he preached the same sermon all three times. And I thought, what the hell? This would be much easier to be an evangelist. But what he did... He had come up, he had been led by God to put this material together in such a way that people's hearts were open to God, that they would make a commitment to God in their lives, that they would abandon themselves to God. And in the third, the third time I heard him, he had one different story. And so, you know, having seen this very effective evangelist, that also feeds into my mind that this was Jesus' stump speech, that he was using this and repeating it so they would get into people's hearts and would give people a way to enter into the life with God. You know, Matthew, I said, has, has this as the Sermon on the Mount, um, and that reminds us of another lawgiver, Moses, who's on the Mount, Mount Horeb, Mount, Mount Sinai, uh, giving the law. Um, but I think, and there's certain a certain piece of law about it, that Jesus, Jesus focuses on the law and how we're to live our lives, but it goes deeper. That the Sermon on the Mount becomes a sense of the matter of the heart, about a little bit like, you know, what real temptation is. Is it the temptation to misbehave or to not be who you're supposed to be? And so Jesus sends us to a deeper level in the Sermon on the Mount um, and, and teaches us how we can become or enter into or experience the kingdom of God. And I know as Americans and in our current day, we don't like to talk about kingdoms. Um, we talk about the reign of God or God intervening. Whatever makes you comfortable, I'm probably going to use the old words. I mean, when I say we're uncomfortable with kings, because we're Americans, right? Didn't we overthrow King George and start our own country? But there's a different, anytime we use a parental word for God or a word like this, we're talking about a king or a parent that's way beyond any king or parent that we know. So, so all, I think we always need to look through that. Um, so Jesus defines a lot of what the kingdom of God is about and how we can live and grow in the kingdom of God. The other thing about the Sermon on the Mount is it's for followers. Jesus is talking to followers. If you look at the start, it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak. Now, a lot of scholars think that it was just the 12 guys um, his disciples, his first followers. I don't think that's true. And having been to Israel, and when you go to Israel someday, when it's safer, um, it's in the, the traditional side of where the Sermon on the Mount is. It's a hill that overlooks the Sea of Galilee. It's right by the Sea of Galilee. And a nice plain. It's like a reverse amphitheater where Jesus would be on this hill and then people would come down. And if you've ever been by the water and things get magnified... You start whispering, this is one of those places. When you go to the, the site, the traditional site, the Sermon on the Mount, everyone's whispering because it's so loud. So when I, when I say he sat down and talked to his disciples, he was talking to the crowd. 
that these people had caught something. They had been healed by him. They had been touched by him. They had been beckoned literally by him to come follow. And so when it says he sat down to teach his disciples, he was teaching all those in the crowd just as he's teaching us today. Now, one, a friend of mine likes to note that things have gotten messed up because Jesus sat down to teach, and now we stand up to teach, right? That, that everyone else was standing while Jesus was speaking, but it doesn't have much to do with the Sermon on the Mount. So it's for followers, and I put this, these talks together in four talks. The first talk today is about the character of God's kingdom, what God's kingdom is like. Uh, the, second talk is, this, the second talk is about it being a matter of the heart, that it's not some outward law we're following, but something that's integrated with our hearts or our souls or our beings, whatever you like to talk about. And the third one describes the practices, the actual practices that help us grow into the kingdom and grow as Christian followers. And the, the last one, and this is always hard for, for people, is abandonment. That Jesus calls us to abandon our lives to God, to set God's kingdom and our life with God first, and to abandon what we think we are and what we're supposed to do to God's purposes. So we have these four talks, and the first one um, is about the character of God's kingdom. And the 20 verses of the Sermon on the Mount talk a lot about the character of God and who God is. Um, Jesus is very clear that God is with us, that God is interested in our lives, that we're not leading this life alone. And in the, in the Beatitudes, Jesus promises blessings in the biggest struggles of our lives. So you all can, I'm, I don't have time to repeat them all, but you can see, you know, you know, to think that people in poor in spirit are being blessed, that doesn't make sense to us. Or people who are mourning, that there's a blessing there. And, and I guess I look at, you know, this is one of the more famous parts of Jesus' teaching, and there's lots of, no musicians here, well, there are, um, lots of musical settings to the Beatitudes, because there's, there's a beauty in it, there's a promise in it, there's a poetry in it um, that really touches that. And so the Beatitudes promise something unusual in the life with God. Blessings in the midst of life's struggles. Well, why is that? Well, one answer is that when we're in the midst of our struggles, when we've lost control or power, when we do not have ready and workable answers for what's come into our lives, then there's room. There's room for God to come in. Uh, when we are filled up, you know, when our spirit's filled up and we are not mournful or we're not hungering for anything other than we have, there's no room for God to come in. Not that God's not there. It's just we don't notice. We don't have a space for God to come in. And so one of the, one of the gifts of the Beatitudes is, that, is to remember that when our lives get so filled up with ourselves and what we're doing that there's no room for God to come in. And so the Beatitudes remind us over the course of our lives, and we'll see, we'll see most of this, over the course of our lives as Christians, um, that there's room for God to come in. And, and, and as happy, and, and you know, and as happy is different from, from joy, as happy is different from joy, uh, so the blessings are something that's not passing, but more of a way of living. That there's a, the blessing is something more than, oh, this was good, you know, the queen puts her, her wand on you or the, and, and gives you some kind of special dispensation or blessing. No, this is about a whole quality of life, assuming that we're being blessed by God. Frederick Buechner uh, would reinforce this. Um, he says, if you, if you were asked to guess the kind of people Jesus would pick out for special commendations or blessings, we'd be tempted to think that he's going to bless some kind of heroes or spiritual strong person persons of impeccable credentials morally, spiritually, humanly, in every, every which way. And if so, we'd be wrong. Instead, it's, 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 the people who, it's the people who's worth, instead, it's worth noting who Jesus does pick out. And you can look at it as he's calling people. He calls fishermen, tax collectors, prostitutes. He calls all the people who are not the high and mighty, but the people who have room for God to come in. So, um, so it's not the spiritual giants that Jesus calls, but the poor in spirit. As he called them, the ones who are spiritually speaking, have, they have nothing to give and absolutely everything to receive. Like the prodigal son, 
telling his father, I'm not worthy to be called your son, only to discover for the first time that he still had a father, and he had a father all the time. It's not the champions of the faith who can rejoice even in the midst of suffering, but the ones who mourn over their suffering because they know they brought it on themselves or other people have put it on them or they just have such a tender heart that when they see other people suffering that their heart goes out to them. And so there's a blessing there. It's not the strong ones, but the meek ones. And we think about meek and weak going together and they do rhyme, but the word meek means open. It means that there's an openness in our lives. And so the people, you know, the meek doesn't refer to weak or someone you can just walk over, but someone who's open to the life and world about them. Do any of y'all who've had kids, you remember how wonderful it was when they would look at something that you see every day and they just light up? Because we forgot. You know, we forgot that a lightning storm is amazing or the first flower in spring is amazing. And so children because they're learning stuff and it's all sponging in them, give us new eyes to see. And I think that is what meekness is about. It's about being open and noticing just the glory of the fact that we're alive and and we've been given gifts. Jesus doesn't call the righteous, uh, but the ones who hope that someday they'll be righteous. Followers who in the meantime are well aware of the distance they have to go. Um, It's not the winners Jesus is calling, the winners of great victories over evil, but the ones who see the evil and the shortcomings in themselves as they comb their hair, if you have hair, uh, in the bathroom mirror are merciful. They're merciful when they find it in others. It's not the totally pure, but the pure in heart. The ones who are as clay-footed as any of us, but somehow have kept an inner freshness and innocence and teachableness intact. And it's not the ones who have found peace in all its fullness, but the ones who try to bring about peace wherever they go. It's not a, it's the peacemakers are not people who are just making peace for themselves, but for everyone. And then the last one, uh, the ones who side with God and God's kingdom, even though it looks like a losing cause. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And this is the one where Jesus turns to the crowd. They've all been general up to this point. He says, blessed are you when people revile you or persecute you because you're my follower. So you can see in the Beatitudes this, the openness and the challenge that come in life and that bring blessings from God. They're about, the Beatitudes are about blessings of life that come to us whatever we're facing today. That there's no day when we're apart from God. There's no day when God is separated from us. Um, we may be separated from God or not noticing, but in every day, in everything that we go through, there are blessings of God to be with us. I was with someone yesterday whose mother is dying, um, and it's been a long battle with cancer, and she's at that place where she's really not conscious. And her daughter says, you know, I thank God for my mom every day and that I'm here. And there's her mom lying in the most feeble state in the bed in the house. But somehow by her, she says, I have faith. You know, I'm not happy about this, but I have faith um, and trust that she's going to be okay, and so am I. That, I think, is the blessings that come in the Christian life, even in some of our worst circumstances, that God is blessing us. Now, Jay Baldwin, our parishioner, uh, wrote a timely uh, meditation in our Linton meditation book about the Beatitudes. And, and it's, it's really wonderful to read, and I'll, I'll give you part of them. He says, he says, bless her the poor in spirit, and then he prays, Lord, help me recognize my own weakness in spirit and faith. Please grant me the perseverance to continually grow in faith and understanding. Blessed are those who mourn. Lord, help me to mourn my sin. Especially help me to work to do better in the future. Blessed are the pure in heart. Lord, help me be pure of heart so that others might know me to be one of your faithful. Beatitudes becomes a pattern of prayer, doesn't it? You know, instead of looking to be high and mighty, um, it gives us a pattern of prayer to, to be honest with ourselves. To say, you know, if you look around the world especially today, and you don't have a sense of mourning, then you're not paying attention. I mean, there's some bad things going on. Ukraine is top of my list, uh, but there's some terrible things going on in the world. And so as we mourn, as we're aware of them, then, then we can open that, pray to God about it, but also be open to other people who may be going through a hard time that we don't notice. And then I think the third way I like to look at the Beatitudes is that it's a spiritual path. Um, there was a longtime parishioner here uh, named Henry Poor. 
who made me very, sound very quiet. Uh, he, the, man, the man could talk in a loud voice. And he had, a, he had a tough time at some point in his early 30s where he's pushed out as headmaster of a school. And he thought about committing suicide, and he didn't. And, and God saved him from that, and he went on to lead an incredible life. And one of the things that he was convinced of is that no one comes to the Christian life unless they are poor in spirit, unless something has happened to them or to someone they love, that that somehow is the entry point, this idea that we, we, need, we need something. And so it, it made me think um, that, you know, if you look at the Beatitudes, that, that it's, it is a pattern of the spiritual life, that we begin, i got to go back to it, you know, we begin with poor, that we're poor in spirit, that we're open to God. And then we mourn our sin, that we realize what's been going on around us. And then we're teachable, then we're meek. You know, because we've been open to God, we're meek. And then we start hunger and thirsting for righteousness, that we live good lives and that those around us live good lives. And then we realize that we're not leading a good life, and so we can be merciful to others and merciful to ourselves which purifies our heart. When we realize that we, we are sinners like everyone else, it, it helps make our hearts pure. And then we seek peace in ourselves and the lives of others. And then when we do all these things, people don't like it. The world doesn't like it. They want people to get on board with how, how the world goes um, and how we work, which makes us poor in spirit because people are mad at us or they reject us and then we go it goes deeper so you can sort of look at the the beatitudes as a pattern that we all experience in the spiritual life that deepens our hearts that opens us more and more to god and we keep doing it again and again um, as a way to go a way to go deeper so you know the first point is that the the beatitudes remind us that god is with us in our most difficult circumstances the second is we can pray it. And the third is that it's a pattern of the spiritual life. That if we look at how we've grown at different times in our lives, you see a pattern in it. So, salt and light. As we move along. Salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, but as salt has lost its taste, how its saltiness can be restored. You are the light of the world. So one of the things about the faith... And the, the offer of life from God is it comes to us just as we are. That in our own uniqueness, and our own experiences of life, and our own interests and preferences, God calls us to be God's followers. Because God needs all of us in our uniqueness to present the gospel to other people. And so when Jesus says, you are salt and you are light, I think he's saying, don't get rid of your saltiness. And I don't mean how we use salty um, in the world where people might be a little rough mouth and rough living. But to, to, to understand that Jesus is calling us to, to be ourselves, to use the gifts that God has given us. Sometimes I think that there are a lot of followers, but we've got the 12 guys who get named, um, that they're all different people. You know, some are fishermen, tax collectors, or there was, an edu- you know, there was people who were educated, uneducated, and Jesus called all the different varieties of personalities so that they could in turn reach out to other people. So you got Peter and Andrew, brothers, the fishermen. So what's Peter like? He's brash. He's like, let's go. Let's build three tabernacles. I'll never deny you. You know, I'm, I'm, he's, he's right out there. He's, you know, you know um, he acts before he thinks many times. And his brother Andrew, who we hardly see, Andrew's the one that introduces Jesus to Peter. Um, at one point, a bunch of Gentiles come, come to Philip and say, Sir, we would see Jesus. And so Philip goes to Andrew, and Andrew takes him to Jesus. So you see, different personalities. So in the same way, each of us, in our different personalities, have been called to be followers just as we are. That that's who God has called. He hasn't, he hasn't said you have to get a certain degree or you have to accomplish certain things to be my followers. He says, no, I want you just like this. Now, there's some rough edges we're going to smooth up a little bit, but I want you just like this. And so to remain who we are is also one of the gifts of the Beatitudes. You know, some of you hear me quote Catherine of Siena a lot. He said, become who God created you to be, and you'll set the world on fire. You know, that you will be salt. You will be light 
uh, on behalf of others so that they can they so that people see our good works they see who we are and how we live and they're attracted to it i don't know who said this you all have smarter and better, better minds who talk about the that there's an aroma of christ about someone that do you know who that was we'll have to figure it out do you all know who that is well, it could be, could be Henry now, and I'm not sure, but I, I've always liked that impression that, that by who we are as Christians, there's an aroma of Christ and God and God's love about us, and people are attracted to that, like warm bread or chocolate chip cookies um, when they're being pulled out of the oven. That there's a quality of our lives, and God needs each of us and all of us to be, those, to be that salt and light in the world. Um, and, you know, for me as a broken person, um, that's good news that God has called me just as I am to, to live a Christian life, to be a follower of Jesus, to try to live my life as Jesus lived it. And then the last piece for today is Jesus saying, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, going back to trials and errors, there's 613 laws. I mean, I'm still going to eat cheeseburgers, um, you know, I'm not going to keep kosher, but there's, there's some significant laws. I mean, we could take the top, just the Ten Commandments, which we're going to start reading in church on Sunday, next Sunday. That there's, there's a, Jesus is a Jew, and he was brought up trying to follow the law. And where he was born, Nazareth, that was a very conservative Jewish place. And so he knew the law. And not, I'm talking about the human Jesus. I mean, the, the God Jesus, the Word of God, the Logos, you know, wrote the law you know, pass it on to Moses. But I'm talking about Jesus grew up in a culture where following the commandments was what it meant to be a Jew. It, that, that, that actions were not a choice. That, you know, that we have to, that we are called to, to live our lives a certain way. Um, and the Torah, the first five, five books of the Bible, are called the way of life. And if we follow those laws, there's a lot of good life. There's a lot of cultural stuff in there that we decided maybe is not helpful for everyone like kosher and you know some of the sacrificial laws which i've been getting through in my one-year bible and ah, it's a lot of blood um and and so we, we're not doing that but the laws that talk about how we love our neighbor are not optional you know the jesus is expecting us to act and live in a certain way um and and though we are forgiven and saved by grace that we believe that. I mean, Paul says, if you just say, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. But it's not just something in your head. You know, the belief has to play out in the way you live, live your lives. And so that's why Jesus is calling people, hey, I haven't come to get rid of the commandments. You've got to pay attention to them. You've got to pay attention to, the, pay attention to the law's intentions. You know, what is God trying to accomplish? What does this say about God? And what does it say about you and me? And then the talk about exceeding the righteousness of the, the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Well, I, I see there's, they had three, challenge, three challenges. And the first challenge or quality, and Jesus is arguing with them about this all the time, is that they know and say the law, but they don't live it. They know and say the law, but they don't, they're not living by it. And so one of the things that Jesus is interested in is how, is how you know, that we, we know to love our neighbor, but if we never love our neighbor, who cares? I mean, what does that mean? That's, that's nothing. Just that we happen to know the law, but if we're not trying to live by it, then we're not part of the kingdom. Then we're not living into the kingdom and growing into the kingdom. And so Jesus is constant. There's all kinds of arguments. You hear it on Sunday mornings or when you read through the gospel with these religious authorities who are saying, oh, you must do this, but then they're not doing it. Um, you know, you can't, you, you, you can't know or say, thou shalt have no other gods before me when you have other gods. Or something that comes up in 
the three synoptic gospels. Now you say the law is to honor your father and mother, but you're not doing it. You're doing, you're doing other things. And so Jesus is trying to integrate, you know, our, our heads and our hearts uh, to understand that we've got to, we've got to follow the law. The second is, in terms of what righteousness or right living is about, is, you know, there's 613, well, maybe you don't, I, I've already said this, there's 613 laws in the first five books of the Bible. Imagine waking up every day, trying to follow all 613 laws and seeing how you're doing at the end of the day. Okay, I didn't kill anybody today, I didn't commit adultery, it was Sabbath, I kept this, you know, they're so focused on keeping the law that they forget the giver of the law. Uh, that one of the things that I think Jesus is challenging them about and challenging his followers is that the laws are helpful, but they're not the thing, that they can become a false idol. One of the consistent conflicts with Jesus and the religious authorities is keeping Sabbath, not working on the Sabbath. So what does Jesus do? Heals on the Sabbath, teaches on the Sabbath, lets his lets his followers pick grain as they're walking through a field because they're hungry. And he says, no, the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. You have this wrong. These laws come as a gift to us to help us live better, law, better lives. And so Sabbath keeping is about not working seven days a week. It's about having some time for God. It's not about saying, okay, I went to church today, check. Or as one of our administrative assistants used to say, you get a gold star. That's not what it's about. It's about, it's, it's about using the law or living by the law to seek God. And, and third, and this is the final thing, and St. Paul picks this up about what righteousness is. I mean, I think about righteous. I think of high and mighty people and people who are righteous, have righteous indignation. Um, but it really has to do with right relationship, with right living. And so P- Paul picks up the idea that, you know, Abraham and Sarah were considered righteous with God because they trusted in God, because they followed where God told them to go. They had some kind of prayer life with God that we don't really capture in Genesis, and that's what made them righteous. Abraham and Sarah didn't have the law. That was hundreds of years later, and yet they're called righteous. And so when we think about righteousness, it's about right living with God. It's about being living our lives connected to God, or as the Beatitudes say, using seeing where our lives are and letting it open us up to god and so that's when jesus says unless we have that kind of righteousness that living relationship with with god we won't experience we won't experience the kingdom of god we won't notice it questions answers pardon so i've given you the sermon on the mount there's little copies of it uh, and I would suggest that you read it, that you use it as a, a, you know, part of your prayer life, just to read it and see how it touches you. And as we go through these, these classes over the next few weeks, um, that you'll have to, a deeper experience of the kingdom of God at work in your life. Really? Is that boring? There's no questions? I know it wasn't that clear, so... Well, good. Well, have a great week. Enjoy 70 degrees for a couple of days. Yeah, I know. This is, this is all the tricks, you know, the, the tricks of the season.